Hi, you're listening to Tangents, a podcast from Coin Center. I'm your host for this week, Peter Van Valkenburg, Coin Center's Director of Research. And I'm uh, privileged today to speak with Ian Myers uh, as my guest, who's associated with the, the Zcash project and is a cryptographer at University of Maryland now, right? You've, yep. you've started a professorship. Weird time to start a professorship. I haven't actually stepped foot on campus, but yes, I'm officially a professor at the University of Maryland Department of Computer Science. So Ian, to our listeners who you can assume are pretty familiar with um, cryptocurrency um, and, and at least know about Zcash, what's your background in this space? How did you start? How, how did you get, uh, get into cryptocurrency? Uh, when did you first start thinking about privacy and blockchain sort of mashed together? So it was 2011, and this was actually ultimately what led to Zcash. Zcash was my, my PhD thesis, um, because that was when I first heard about Bitcoin and the amount of detail of how it worked. And I realized you know, it's a public blockchain. It has all of these transactions on it. And immediately I realized that that, you know, I didn't know if Bitcoin was going to succeed or not, um, had I far wealthier than I am now. But yeah. uh I realized that if it did succeed, it would have some pretty severe privacy problems because all of that data being public, even though your name's not directly associated with a given transaction, it's very easy using basic techniques in computer science and machine learning to figure that stuff out and match patterns. And so, although I didn't have this phrasing at the time, the reality is uh, cryptocurrency is Twitter for your bank account. Right. And I was interested in fixing that. And that's been one of my major research areas uh, since then. Yeah, I'm curious. So do you remember like the first time someone mentioned Bitcoin to you or you found it on a forum or something? Was it like Bitcoin talk or? No, the first time someone mentioned Bitcoin to me was a year before that in a makerspace in Seattle. I had been working at Microsoft at the time and they were making fun of it as um, being worthless internet points. In fact, someone else had made their own currency, but it was a physical printed currency. So this was before people did um, stupid novelty forks. Uh, yeah. So that was the first thing I'd heard of it. Yeah. Um, which and is, so the white paper from Satoshi has a has a chapter or a section, I think it's like section seven or eight or something on privacy. And I'm trying to remember, I don't have it in front of me right now. I'm trying to remember the specific wording. Satoshi says something along the lines of if addresses can be linked to other addresses, which is likely possible, privacy may be an issue. Um, yeah. But, and then there's some hand waving like, Pseudonymity is good enough for now is sort of the sense you get for, from, from the white paper. Like Satoshi didn't make strong claims uh, to privacy beyond just Bitcoin pseudonymity. But you're right. Um, what we've ended up with is, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good turn of phrase, Twitter for your bank account. Although that's, that's kind of like Venmo, which you make fun of me for using the other day. <laughs> no, no, I made fun of you for having your, your stuff public. Um, which was all of my transactions public. <laughs> no, but you had recent ones. You see, you got you got to signal the uh, the very plain vanilla ones so that there's not just an absence of data, which itself is data. Well, this, this is exactly the problem with surveillance states and the stuff. Even if you're using hidden stuff, unless it's common practice, is uh, itself a red flag. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right. Because uh, what was it? The Navy developed Tor, right? Mm hmm. And part of the reason they open sourced it and wanted a lot of people to use it, right, is because if you're the only person using Tor, you're very evidently working for the U.S. government. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're like two different. So this is kind of funny. But the, one of the largest pieces of privacy enhancing technology is actually used for people who don't know is Tor. And it came out of uh, U.S. government funding and currently is still mainly supported by the U.S. government, though primarily by the State Department. Mm -hmm. So there are these two things people want for it. One is they want to be able to circumvent censorship and let people be anonymous in other countries, dissidents, democracy activists, et cetera. Uh, and the other one is uh, U.S. people want to be able to operate on the internet anonymously for political and covert reasons. So it's this weird, it makes strange bedfellows. I've always wondered if that would work in the Bitcoin or Zcash or Monero or crypto space as a way to sort of um, get folks, because Coin Center, my day job is, you know, educating people in government about the technology and explaining why th that it's just, it's, it's just a technology. It can be used for good and for bad. You're not going to put it back in the box, so you might as well use it. Um, I wonder if, like how good the, I've used the metaphor before, but I always wonder how, how, how robustly it stands up. Like if a CIA agent working in Iran 
wanted to receive payments, uh, is if they receive Bitcoin as a payment, A, would it be useful to them in their mission in Iran? I don't know. B, would it be noted and would they be immediately pegged as a CIA agent or are there other people in Iran accepting these payments? And then I guess D is taking all that together. If the answer is yes, they could get use out of this technology. Is that enough to convince somebody that, that you know, anyone using it to violate sanctions in Iran um, is, is, is an acceptable part <laughs> of the tech if we also need it for our agents in Iran, which is basically how we feel about Tor, right? We don't yeah. see people necessarily out there asking for us to ban Tor because I think it's more obvious to people that it is useful to folks um, who are doing good things, um, if you assume the CIA is doing good things, um, as much as it's useful to folks doing bad things. I think the issue there is that, uh, you know, we can talk about free speech and surveillance and everything, but those are very different in terms of the U.S. government's opinions than money, right? Yeah. In general, the U.S. doesn't control free speech as a tool of policy. I mean, they do in some cases, maybe, but it's not a general, you know, it, the it's, first it's unconstitutional, is, right, to, yes. to use it as a tool. Um, they might do it sort of surreptitiously sometimes, but... Yeah. And, you know, like everyone else, they have propaganda, but also it's it's not easy to project that overseas where you literally don't have jurisdiction. Um, but the modern banking system is used uh, both by the U.S. and by, by just the entire international community as a way of sanctioning pariah governments. Right. Um, and that is probably something they don't want to give up on merely to be able to pay assets in a country where they could use cash or something else. Yeah. Also, using Bitcoin would be somewhat fraught. It would work for a while and then someone would get caught because people always get caught. And then you could start looking for patterns where you noticed how payments were being handled, what addresses were being used, and you could um, roll up an entire SBN notch network. And this is happened for other things, ways you communicate with agents. Actually, the U.S. lost uh, some 30 people in Iran and China because they were using these decoy uh, websites that were d dummy resume drops to communicate with people. Oh. And um, no one exactly knows how, because, of course, these things are classified and even, you know, the CIA may not know the exact details, but apparently the Iranians uh, found somebody, found out how they were communicating back, and then they went and just searched for for everybody who'd been visiting similar websites with similar pieces of JavaScript, because that JavaScript was unique. Right, so and kind of like how if you identify one Bitcoin address, you can start doing clustering analysis and you, yeah. you can round up a whole bunch of agents if you would. Yeah. yeah. If there's anyone sitting in, in Langley or McLean thinking about using Bitcoin, uh, be careful and uh, go talk to some expert beforehand. Yeah, that sounds right. Because there are ways to use Bitcoin privately, it's worth noting, uh -huh. like Wasabi Wallet and things like that. Which yeah, those, I would not use those if I was in the, the threat model of, of do you think there's a government after you. I think the, the largest thing to say about Bitcoin uh, privately, and I can't remember, who's the guy at the Human Rights? Um, oh, Alex Gladstein. Yeah, Alex Gladstein's routine is that you know Bitcoin is private, and his view is basically if you take cash, convert it to Bitcoin, send it across the a border or wherever to someone else and they immediately convert it back to cash, then, you know, there's no harm, no foul. And barring very stupid things, that's probably true, but the privacy there is from the cash, right? Like yeah. that's the actual disconnect in both ends of your identity. And if you were to try to hold cryptocurrency and use it for multiple things, then you risk linking all your activities. Sure, together. sure. And I mean, I think uh, uh, to defend Alex, whose work I, I, I admire a lot, um, I think like searching for the simplest minimum viable digital currency product to do something like private transactions overseas, um, I think his choice would be let's use the tried and trusted thing, Bitcoin, and then get out of it as soon as possible. And, no, that's I, and I think for, for that goal, it's, it's absolutely acceptable. And like, if that's literally what you're doing, you're literally only converting back and forth, then it's far better than anything else you could do. Um, my worry is if you, if you, it's worth doing, but you should be aware that in a couple of years, if people keep doing that, yeah. then all of a sudden people are going to start skimping on the converting back because their local currency is not as stable, for example, or it can be more easily seized because, well, it's physical money that the government can, when they shake you down, knows you have. And, um, and this aspect of Bitcoin as a privacy solution would not work uh, if your use case isn't um, 
carefully and occasionally funding persons overseas, yeah. but is instead everybody just trying to go about their daily lives, making transactions um, right. on the internet in the native currency of the internet, which ideally would be a cryptocurrency. Right. At that point, if it's Bitcoin, you've got the Twitter for your bank account problem, right? Yeah. Or even before then, if the people overseas start using it, like if you're in Venezuela, and from what I understand, this is not the case. Yeah, but if you're in Venezuela and for some reason people stopped converting to Bolivars or USD, I think, and started natively transaction in Bitcoin, well, then you can imagine, okay, you get one dissident, uh, you find out what they're doing, and then you notice they've been shopping at a coffee shop along with some other people who you also were suspicious of. And in very short order, you start unraveling this entire network of people. Yeah. Um, it would be bad. So aside from Twitter for your bank account, another thing I've heard you say before is that Zcash, um, so this this newer cryptocurrency that has more privacy protecting uh, capabilities, uh, is like HTTPS um, for money. Uh, I think, you know, I think hopefully most of our audience knows what HTTP and HTTPS are, but why don't you briefly explain those two things in order to help us all understand why maybe or maybe not Zcash is like an HTTPS for money? So credit to that one actually goes to Zuko, um, the CEO of Zcash. Um, so HTTP is the normal way you, you connect on the internet to, say, get your uh, news or if you're using email or pornography or whatever it is you do. Um, Nobody but you uses do that, internet for porn, Ian. Nobody. Right, yeah. Avenue Q. Clearly, go read it. Um, listen to it. But uh, if you do that, um, and it's normal HTTP, anybody who's listening, say, if you're in a coffee shop or something to your Wi-Fi or, you know, governments, whoever can actually have um, phone lines, can see everything you do. They'll see the, the, your username, your password, your email contents, your credit card number. And so over the past 20 years, there's been a a push that like, really, this isn't secure, this isn't safe, you shouldn't use it. And everybody should use what's called HTTPS. The S stands for secure. So it's the hyper transport, hyper text transport protocol secure. Um, and uh, this gives you protection against someone eavesdropping on your conversations. And so the analog analogy here is that Bitcoin is a HTTP, everything you do is public. Uh, and Zcash adds privacy and security that nobody can figure out what you're doing with your money. So it takes to be S for money. Right. And there was a push. So, you know, like when was it that most people started using the web most of the time with, with HTTPS? There was a push like what in like the, God, around like 2000, I feel like up until 2005, 2010, it was, I was still always using HTTP for almost all sites, right? It was because it was difficult yeah. to get a, a, a certificate, which, is how HTTPS works. Was the SSL right. protocol? So there were two two different ones. One places that really should have been using it, like banks and email providers, weren't, or they were only using it for like your password when you logged in, because that was the most sensitive thing, right? But of course, <laughs> then you log in, then all of your email gets out. Yeah, or that your banking is, activities. Or right? your banking yeah. information. That <laughs> is more sensitive than my password. I can change. At least my they didn't password. get my password. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they just um, got all my personal information. So that was like 2005 into 2010, 12, where people sort of were cognizant and best practices changed. And then there started to be this movement of there should be HTTPS just everywhere. Right. Because anything you see might be, uh, you know, sensitive, right? Uh, for the people who do use the internet for porn, right? Well, if you're browsing normal porn, okay, fine. But if you're like in the closet or some other like thing that you could be blackmailed over, you want to hide that, for example, is a, a thing that could come up, right? If you were uh, using a dating website because you were having an affair, well, uh, that would also be a problem that could, someone could exploit. And so people started saying you should use HTTPS everywhere because actually you don't know what sensitive, what might build up a picture of you to cause problems. I think that's right. And, and uh, as a sort of folk theorem, I don't know the, the truth of this, but I feel like the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, is probably someone who we have to thank for a lot of that movement, um, both in their yeah. advocacy for using SSL everywhere for, for and also in their uh, let's, it's, let's Encrypt was their program yeah. where they helped people figure out how to create their own certificates or they became a certificate authority themselves. Yeah, they became right? a certificate authority. So they, they, got, they recruited a bunch of people and money from various donors and they actually now make it very easy to um, 
set up an HTTPS connection because uh, these things depend on what are called certificates, which are basically a this person's who they say they are. And prior to this, you had to pay a fair amount of money and it was somewhat arcane even to set it up. And so they made it free and then they made very basic, nice scripts that you basically just run on any standard web server and it's just an auto-renewing procedure. Set it, forget about it. Yeah, I see. I see. This as like a, a a great recent success story of a nonprofit looking out for the public interest mm-hmm. to build tools and tooling that actually can make a really significant difference in the level of privacy that your average citizen has. You know, regardless of whether they're sophisticated or not. Yep. Because a lot of small websites that an average person would visit weren't previously uh, going to be visited using HTTPS. But now almost all of them will be. And in fact, Chrome will now warn you, I think, if you're ever visiting a site that doesn't use um, right. HTTPS. That was the, the last end of this odyssey of we've now decided to label, uh, instead of saying it's HTTPS for secure, we've decided to label in the UX for Chrome and I think Safari and Firefox that uh, non-encrypted connections are in fact explicitly insecure. Right. Despite the uh, fact that like that was just how the internet was for... Yeah decades because the internet's surprisingly old just like us now yeah um, <laughs> but there's a funny pitfall there too actually because what once we got all this pressure to do https um people started taking shortcuts to get it so ideally the connection from your iphone or your laptop to say your email provider or whoever it is is connect encrypted all the way through and you don't have to worry about anybody in the middle but if Somebody doesn't want to go to the trouble of setting it up. There are services that will give you uh, a encrypted connection, but it's only like half the distance, right? It's like from you to this um, uh, uh, cloud provider, yeah. and then the actual backend connection is still exposed and anyone who can listen to it. Interesting. And so it's, it's actually funny. That's still better than nothing, but it's actually, depending on what you're worried about and who you're after, it doesn't help you. Um, in some limited cases, and it uh, can make it very hard to figure out what the actual security situation is. Right, because you think you're encrypted, but actually it's not end-to-end. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so that um, that brings me to uh, the Zcash Foundation, where um, I should disclose, because of the nature of this podcast, um, I'm uh, on the board of directors, and Ian is also on the board of directors of the Zcash Foundation. And I think so, you know, Zcash is a big topic, and I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts of the full Zcash ecosystem right now. But so, as you said, it is Zuko, um, the CEO of uh, the electronic coin company, who uh, was uh, the first person probably to say that uh, Zcash is like HTTPS for money and tell that story. Um, the electronic coin company is a private company that developed the original protocol. Um, and the foundation is this thing that sprang up a little bit later. Uh, thanks in large part to um, Andrew Miller, the chairman of the board, um, who we should have on the show at some point, um, but also to a bunch of people who are just dedicated to the technology, uh, uh, myself included. Speaking of the EFF and their role in you know just looking out for the general public and building common sense tooling and things that should have been built a while ago, to enhance the privacy of the general public when they use the internet. That's, that's actually, I think, like a really good summary of why we should have the Zcash Foundation, whose mission is first and foremost um, to make sure that there's technological tooling out there that allows people to make private transactions, financial transactions, rather than communications transactions over the internet. Um, our goal is not to necessarily ensure that Zcash specifically su- survives or that it goes to the moon or all the other things that you hear about in, in crypto land. Um, it's just really to make sure that there are these tools for private transactions uh, available to the general public. Um, Ian, you joined the board. Uh, when did you join the board? Uh, it was directly after Zcon 1. So that would have been June... No, Zcon. Yeah, Zcon one. So that would have been June of last year. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm flies, doesn't it? Especially during COVID. Um, and aside from being a board member, uh, as you said in the beginning, um, the protocol at that point was it called the Zero Coin Protocol? When you uh, were so there was a sequence of papers. There was Zero Coin, which is the first academic uh, major paper ever published. Then there was Zero Cash, which was a successor. 
which fixed a lot of problems. And that was what originally finally became Zcash. So got it. Uh, got it. Me and my co-authors co-founded the company with Zuko and um, we spun the thing up. That's right. And so, so you, you are one of what are sometimes referred to as the seven scientists, correct? Mm -hmm. Which are these folks who mostly, uh, I guess, entirely all academic cryptographers, right? Uh, yeah, all of them are now uh, faculty. Well, the, the senior people are already faculty. All of them are either faculty at various universities or one of them, Matters Views, uh, uh, decided not to do that and is at Coin Center and MIT. Uh, not Coin Center, uh, the <laughs> DC, whatever it is at MIT. Myself? Wait, where? Um, uh, MIT's. Uh, oh, the Digital Currency Initiative, DCI. Yeah, That's DCI. right. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, to me, this is something that's kind of unique about Zcash. And uh, maybe it exists in other cryptocurrency communities, but it's it's interesting to me the number of academics involved in this space. And I feel like that has some great advantages because you're dealing with sort of cutting edge cryptography, which is, you know, more of a mathematical and academic discipline than than just normal computer science. Um, but it also maybe has some pitfalls like uh, academics aren't very, you know, business model minded. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. There are a number of uh, these got derisively termed by some uh, VC friends of mine, professor points that came out um, a bit later. Zcash was paper was 2014, company was formed February 2015, product went live 2016. I think this stuff was all 2018, 2019. But those were all like one or two. Uh, academics, um, and some of them were quite good and, and quite interesting. But this was sort of, I think, one of the first. It definitely was the largest set of uh, co-authors who went into it together. Um, and it's been interesting because um, our goal wasn't exactly to build a cryptocurrency. We just wanted to see the stuff used. I remember right. I, I gave a talk at, at Bitcoin 2013, back when there was one Bitcoin conference in San Jose. <laughs> and I was just presenting this uh, zero coin originally, just like, you know, here's a thing. This is how you might do this. And uh, one of the Bitcoin core devs stood up and said, well, this is interesting, but we're never going to implement it in Bitcoin. And um, at the time, it uh, slightly annoyed me. But no, I think they were right that these kind of things need to be proved before you use them. So the reality of the matter is, in order to test any of these schemes, any of these things, you have to build a cryptocurrency and launch it and validate the technology. And after that, as long as somebody uses it and something and succeeds, I think I've accomplished what I've set out to do and what is explicitly the mission of the Zcash Foundation. Yeah, I know. There's a, there's a lot there to unpack. I think one, one thing I like is that, so, so one thing that I, I always, so people sometimes say, well, Peter, you're so in, interested in Zcash, but you're supposed to be neutral because you're at Coin Center. I say, well, no, I mean, honestly, I just really like crypto uh, writ large, not the scammy stuff. And I love Bitcoin. Um, uh, we can talk all we want about how, yes, it's it's very transparent, uh, especially now that we have companies like Chainalysis doing, you know, clustering analysis of blockchain addresses. But the mission of Bitcoin is to build sound money, uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's this minimum viable product that the the idea is we should just have a fixed supply of units, and people can own them. And that can be a safe way to store wealth, even if you're in a, 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 a kleptocratic state or, or a totalitarian government or, or any number of things. And so I guess the criticism um, from privacy folks is like, well, it's too public. Uh, why don't you just use the Zcash tech? And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it clouds the sort of original mission of Bitcoin to force this other thing in and endangers that original mission because while, you know, we believe that there's a lot of um, soundness to the engineering and the computer science behind Zcash, it is more complicated features and, and more untested stuff. So why not run parallel? Why not have both? I think, I think it's even more fundamental than that. So um, maybe we'll end up going into how Zcash works. Uh, but the two things you need to hide if you want privacy, it's who you're paying, which is called the transaction graph in terms of technical terms. And then you also need to hide the amount, right. like how much you're paying, because uh, if the amounts are public, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on. And I should note here that hiding the amount is not nearly enough to give you privacy. In fact, if you newly hide the amount, it won't do much. Uh, you know, Nobody's going to be wondering how much a value of a payment to Lamborghini Italia SA is. Right? They're not going to think you bought a coffee. They're going to know you bought a Lamborghini even if the value is hidden. Um, but the table stakes is hiding the value. And the moment you've done that, 
I mean, no matter how many cryptographic guarantees and how much like auditing protocols and things we can build to give you some assurance that it's stable, you have given up on the basic, anybody can just look at the blockchain and count the amount of money and validate that there only are 21 million coins or whatever. Right. And that is, I think, you know, uh, fundamental. I'm not going to knock on wood to mess up your audio in this thing, but I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I will stake my, my uh, professional expertise as a cryptographer that it'll be very hard to build a system where you can audit anytime you want and get assurance that there's no inflation and still get privacy. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I think it's fair to to briefly describe how Zcash works as you have this proof system using zero knowledge proofs, which is a, a, a mathematical construct that we don't need to get into because it's extremely complicated. But, and we say that, well, we can mathematically prove that I've spent and given to somebody else one of a finite set. Right. And all you learn by looking at the proof is yes, true statement. He spent one of a finite set. He didn't spend one that came out of thin air. But you're right to say that that's different than I can see the full set and yeah. I can find the specific transactions in that set that go all the way back to the first unit created um, whenever the Bitcoin was created in the, in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. That's something I can just like sort of do as even a lay person, you'd be sifting through a whole lot of data, but you could just do without reliance on any kind of complicated mathematical proof structure. Whereas yeah. to do it with Zcash, we rely on a mathematical proof structure that, that we have reasonable confidence works, right? Like the math works, but there's mm -hmm. something fundamentally different about trusting in that kind of math versus just doing your own personal accounting of all the intermediate yeah. hops of a transaction. I think it's, it's fundamentally different is maybe an accurate but, but um, deceptive uh, description because it is, it's true, right? It's definitely philosophically different. Um, but then if you look at like the history of an inflation box and there have been uh, you know, ones that were found and, and fixed in Bitcoin and Monero and, and in Zcash, they come back to effectively software bugs. And so, uh, and you're dependent on software no matter what the blockchain is to understand what happened. Right. And so, there's a major conceptual and philosophical difference. I'm not honestly altogether sold that it in practice matters as much as people think it does. I think there are really these risks no matter what. This is an interesting thing about computer science that I think, uh, as, a, as I'm trained as a lawyer, I'm not a mathematician or a computer science, but people in the computer science arena often criticize the law for being sort of vague and flexible and mm -hmm. non-deterministic. Um, because they like black and white answers, right? But if you accept that all software has bugs uh, at some point in the process, then our understanding of the software until we realize the bug exists is kind of a vague and metaphorical understanding of the software. It's understanding of the software qua what the software is supposed to do, not what right. it actually does with the bug. So actually, maybe law and software aren't all that far apart here. It's just that the lawyers are a bit more loosey-goosey and tolerate a bit more bugs. Uh, if anything, we incorporate them and we call them like precedent for future holdings. Right. <laughs> and and uh, there's also, you know, of course, the standard joke that, that computer scientists happen to have very erroneous opinions of the law, right? You can do law school in four years instead of three. If you're a computer scientist, the fourth zero of the year is spent repeating the law is not a computer program for a year. <laughs> um, very good. Which seems to have an interesting thing about smart contracts in there. But uh, I hate the term. I have spent so much time at Coin Center uh, <laughs> loathing the term and telling people that they're often neither smart nor contracts, which I think um, Patrick Merck was the, uh, who's who also at DCI, I think, or, or no, he's at Harvard now, I think, it was one of the first to point out. But anyway, um, so let's see. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? So we've started broaching this topic um, because we've been talking about sort of the levels of complexity in software and the vulnerabilities. Um, one thing I know that um, you've been thinking about lately because you've been thinking about posting a blog post about this, which will probably come out soon, <laughs> is this, um, this question of Zcash's trusted setup. Uh, what is the trusted setup and, 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 and why is it uh, relevant to Zcash? Right. So as you, you said earlier, the core component uh, of Zcash is uh, a zero-knowledge proof. So in, in, in Bitcoin, 
You just, if you're spending money, you identify the exact transaction that paid you and say, I'm spending this money. This is how I got it. And that's exactly where its privacy uh, concern comes from. In Zcash, we go, well, of all the sets of, of unspent transactions, uh, we're spending one of them and we're going to prove it to you. And this is done by creating a Merkle tree and proving you know, a path through it. And it's uh, the way you do that efficiently is through a thing called a ZK snark. And the best, most practical ZK snarks we have require what is known as a trusted setup, which means some set of people have to get together and generate a set of numbers in a particular way and then forget um, some secret details. And provided they forget them, this entire thing is, is perfectly sound. Nobody can invent money. Nobody can figure out what's going on. But if those people colluded, uh, they could print money. And so the thing you need to do and the thing that Zcash did is you get, uh, I think for the current version, we got something like 60 some odd people uh, to participate in each phase of this thing. And as long as one of those people is honest, then there is no way for them to, to abuse this information and print money. Right. Is this, um, is the term shared secret the right term for sort of that? It, you could describe it as such. Um, yeah, you end up generating, a, it's actually, it's a secret of which each person knows a share. Right. And as long as at least one person forgets their share, then there's yeah. no way to print money. And that's sort of, um, sort of metaphysically uncommon in the real world that like your safety guarantee is quite literally, not just faith in a group of people, but faith in the smallest fraction of that group of people that's an individual. <laughs> one time faith. And so this is, I think, the, the thing where, um, you know, the, the thing that people say about Bitcoin is that you, you don't need to trust anybody. And, um, you know, a number of people pointed out this isn't entirely true, right? You have to trust the software developers. Um, actually, there's some questions about uh, weak consistency and what it actually means to unambiguously evaluate consensus. Um, in some circumstances. Uh, but the contrast between that and the financial system is, is quite right. That like the modern financial system requires you to, on an ongoing basis, trust a number of vested institutions who you may or may not have reason to trust. They may not be in the right jurisdiction. They may have reasons to, to do whatever. And there's a long history of both good and bad things coming out of finance. Um, and Zika sits in this weird middle ground where it's, you just had to trust some collection of people once, and you only have to trust that one of them was honest. And yeah. once you make that assumption, there's an, there, yeah, there, there's an interesting. Um, so, so the financial system is extremely fragile from a trust standpoint in that sense, and, and you're right to point that out. But there's an interesting difference in the way the financial system evolved. We, we it, it evolved to rely on things like chargebacks and the courts. Um, mm -hmm. to sort of arbitrate screw ups or fraud after the fact. And it tolerates a lot of fraud and screw ups and bugs, if you will, mm -hmm. um, uh, ex post under the understanding that ex ante will use the courts or other things to clean it up. And the philosophy of computer scientists, this is actually goes back to what we we're saying about law, like lawyers just accept all kinds of mess and sometimes turn it into precedent or sometimes fix it later. The philosophy of computer scientists and people who are trying to build digital money like Bitcoin and Zcash is we need to get as much right and robust up front before the system's live because we don't want to be arbitrating ex ante because we don't want to be using the law to fix things and we don't want to necessarily have to roll back the blockchain. Um, yeah. It's almost like this, this amazing, I don't think people uh, appreciate this enough, this amazing ambition to build the new rules of physics and then let the world unfold like a, like God makes a clock and the clock ticks yeah. on and doesn't interfere later. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like building a, an ecosystem in a, in, a, in a glass jar. That's right. Yeah, which um, some good YouTube yeah. videos of this. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's one of these things of like, you know, we can get better and better about this both as a matter of practice and if you want as a matter of mathematics of like, you know, there are processes for doing formal verification uh, of, say, uh, elements of cryptographic protocols, circuits, snark, et cetera. And, you know, you can spend lots of money about it. So you can have your, your stuff uh, open source and sort of almost ritualize the process of doing this to make it uh, as assured as possible that you don't get these bugs. Um, right. So it's, the trust it's interesting is to me, the contrast to this, we're taking all this sort of risk 
to get privacy, which I think is the one like thing you can't put back on the bottle if you break it. Yeah. Right. Like, it's like entropy. Backs. What? It's literally entropy. It's yeah. that inf information doesn't stay. Once it goes out, it, the, yeah. uh, the shatters of the egg don't leap off the ground and come back onto my table and re reassemble themselves. Yeah. yeah. Courts can put together back together money that's been, been stolen, weird other things that happen. You may or may not want them to, like that's a valid question. But once the information's out there, I mean, the right to be forgotten doesn't really work. I was gonna, I was gonna bring it up. I mean, it, it's, it's maybe a noble aspiration, but the collateral damage of actually forcing everyone to uh, at least claim to forget something. <laughs> from a legal standpoint is a nightmare. Yeah. So this trusted setup um, was necessary in order to create these um, cryptographic primitives that allow us to have proofs on the blockchain instead of transactions on the blockchain and allow us to have some faith that a Zcash transaction is bona fide and not counterfeit, um, but don't reveal, as you said, the sender recipient or the amount sent. Um, but people often, uh, and I'm doing that thing where I'm just going to vaguely say people often criticize, like, who are these people? But people do criticize Zcash for having this trusted setup because it's sometimes seen as sort of like an original sin compared to um, Bitcoin where you never had to trust anyone in theory. You just looked at the software and said, okay, yeah, I'll run this software. With Zcash, you have to say, okay, there are these, there are these 60 people in the, in the newer ceremony. There was an earlier ceremony with even fewer people. I have to trust that at least one of them wasn't uh, colluding with all the others in order to trust this. And I can't necessarily see that just from the software. Mm -hmm. So is the trusted setup actually a, a sort of a problem, fundamental problem in Zcash? I don't think so for two reasons. One, I don't think the market for cryptocurrency really is the current set of people. And so to the extent that they say this, you know, most people are not concerned with that. But more importantly, I think that uh, there is an underlying truth in that statement, but it's not about the trust itself, right? Because what's the actual risk? Nobody is really going to claim that these, you know, all these people colluded, right? That the money hasn't been stolen now, you have reasonable expertise. What they're really telling you is there's a risk that there is inflation, that you don't know how much the monetary supply is. That is, in fact, a risk. Right. Because yeah, actually, we probably should have mentioned um, if the setup is busted instead mm -hmm. of trusted, uh, yeah. you can't suddenly unblind Zcash transactions. You can't uh, actually suddenly read all of the previously private transactions as public. That's not possible. That yeah. is just lost forever because it was never put on the blockchain to begin with. The proof was. But you could construct false proofs yeah. and, and claim to spend Zcash that's bona fide when in reality you're just printing up new Zcash. So as you said, it's, a, it's another vector for an inflation bug. Right. And so I think, right, when, when Zcash launched... Uh, it was uh, somewhat high profile. I think it was like page B6 of the New York Times because this was before most of the other cryptocurrencies after Bitcoin had launched. I think it was us, Ethereum, and, uh, and, and Bitcoin, basically. Um, a lot of people, you know, and the one the way the cryptocurrency community is, like it becomes a sort of tribal thing. And so this was, you know, the answer of why not Zcash is, well, trust itself. Hmm. Um, and it was sort of a meme. And uh, the underlying truth like it's like the lowest hanging fruit of things yes. you can criticize a thing for when you're just looking to pick something to criticize. Yeah. And, and there is an underlying truth to it. Yeah. But the underlying truth to it is, while well, you don't have absolute assurity of the coin supply. And as I alluded to earlier, that does not go away whether even without a trusted setup because you still have to hide the amount of money involved. And so if there is a bug, and, right, and we know there can be those bugs that happened in things that didn't have trusted setup, right, that happened even in Bitcoin, right? If there is a bug, you wouldn't be able to tell in something that provides privacy. And so fundamentally, the, the deal you have to make uh, to get privacy in the cryptocurrency is being willing to live with that risk. Right. right. And of course, you go through serious rigor to make sure that that risk isn't really going to happen. Right. It's like, you know, sending someone to the moon. Right. You do a whole dedicated engineering process and assurances to make sure it works out. But yeah, if you're going to take a flight to the moon, there is a small risk that your rocket blows up. And right. you cannot avoid that, uh, except to say that you don't want to go there. And I think we need privacy. And, and, and this goes back to what we were saying earlier about sort of a, a division of labor in cryptocurrencies. Like, uh, it's, it's okay that some cryptocurrencies have different strengths and different weaknesses. 
Yeah. Uh, and Bitcoin has this strength of a very auditable supply. So if there was an inflation bug, as there have been in the past, it would be immediately apparent. Um, but the trade-off there is you have very little privacy when you transact with Bitcoin. Right. And Zcash has much better privacy, but inflation bugs might be hard to spot. And I think right. like an intuitive way for non-crypto, non-technical people to think about this is you don't walk around with all of your cash, all of your net worth in your wallet. Um, your wallet, the cash in your wallet is very private and that's kind of mm -hmm. nice. Um, but it's also easy for it to be stolen. It's hard to fit that much cash in your wallet. Like there are, there are very obvious physical downsides that become immediately apparent if you walk around with most of your net wor worth in a suitcase. Um, but that said, you also might not want to keep all your money in a bank account because right. your bank could seize that money. Um, they could do it because they're an unscrupulous corporation. They could do it because they've been um, um, co-opted or commandeered by the government and the government doesn't like you anymore. Uh, they could also just fail to secure your money. It could be stolen. Um, and so you want to balance. And so if some people are going to use Bitcoin as a store of value, uh, and then maybe use small amounts uh, of Zcash for individual transactions that they don't want tracked. That's a, an interesting division of labor. I'm not saying it's always the right one, but uh, I think I think people too often become tribal, like you were saying. Yeah. Think that like it's got to be one coin that rules them all, and then I'm going to fight all the others. And that's yeah. I mean, there's no there's there are fundamentally trade offs that need to be settled, and I think the res resolution is you can choose, right? So because to take your analogy. Um, you, your money in your wallet is somewhat private. You would not want to show, walk around in most parts of the world with like all of the money in your wallet just taped to your chest so then you could see how much money you had, no. right? That actually is what you would be doing in most cryptocurrencies. With Bitcoin, yeah. Right? I and so with Bitcoin, that's fine if you, if you just store it. But if you're doing the metaphorical version of walking out through the market square, that will attract all kinds of attention. Yeah, I've, I've always, this is a bit of a tangent, although the name of this podcast is Tangent, so it's fine. I've always wondered if there's, because um, there's always been this fear amongst Bitcoiners that like it'll become public knowledge how much Bitcoin they have and then there'll be a target for like kidnapping and things like that. Has it ever materialized? I've never actually heard of any actual cases there of this. Were, yeah, for a while, um, actually, I won't say who, not to, to precisely because of this fear, yeah. but uh, I, I knew somebody was tracking this. And for a while, there were a couple of instances in the Ukraine, uh, sorry, in Ukraine, uh, there was one instance somewhere in Latin America that I think was not Venezuela, and there was an instance in New Jersey. Um, uh, <laughs> no, Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that one was a, was uh, someone who was in the same social circle. Uh, they got into an Uber that was not an Uber. And then it got oh them forced to uh, withdraw all of their money. Um, I, I should say also that, like, I, uh, when I was in New York, um, I knew a number of, of people who worked with various crypto hedge funds. And there certainly were places where, if you had shown up to the office, um, they have this nice, fun, multi-signature setup with required five people, all of whom worked in the same open office on some floor of a building with no security, right? And you could have walked off with millions of dollars of, of various assets in short order. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so let's I know one prominent person whose name I will not say I'll tell you afterwards, uh, who carried, or at least was willing to say that they carried the net worth around on a ledger nano on their person. They 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 were willing to say that. Yes. They just sort of sort of advertised. <laughs> they said it to a bunch of people they didn't know it drinks after a conference. Oh, upset yeah. thing. All right. Um Let's switch gears uh, in, the, in the last few minutes of this uh, podcast and talk about um, another thing that I know you're interested in with respect to Zcash, which is user-defined assets. So this notion that... So for, for, for people who aren't familiar with Zcash uh, intimately, it's a lot like Bitcoin. The only assets on the protocol are the Zcash units themselves, which is always awkward with Zcash because it's like, it's the Z I'm sending you a Zcash, not a coin. It's exactly, like a, I think it's like the camera bar that everyone uses. Yeah. A Zach. A Zach. Yeah. I hate, I hate the, the, the sort of like, uh, we're just going to borrow from stock symbols and then use the yeah. stock symbols as terminology all the time. But anyway, so... The entire thing, frankly. Wait, what? 
there are too many Zs in the entire thing, right? ZK Snark, Zcash, Zach. It's, it's like it just gets even Zuko. Like yeah. Z- Zuko, the 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 head of the ECC, happens to have this name. I, I've had to tell people this too. I'm like, no, Zuko was his name was Zuko before Zcash, uh, and Zcash is not named after Zuko. I think he changed his name from something else, um, but it's pure coincidence that they're both Z's. Uh, yeah, yeah, unless there's some changed, sort of strange. He didn't change his name. Actually, I don't believe he did. Leave. He changed his name. His legal name is something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, um, so user defined assets. So the only assets moving around on the Zcash protocol are Zek, to use the securities type terminology, unfortunately. Um, whereas you look at Ethereum and there are like, there's like, <laughs> like you open the door and like thousands of coins come out and you're like, Oh God, what is this? It's a sushi or it's a yam or it's a, any number of things. And so by user defined assets, we're just talking about like, uh, some protocols are amenable to having anybody create their own asset and it's secured, um, by the underlying protocol. Um, even though it's not the basic unit of that protocol, like ether is to Ethereum. So one criticism I've heard people talk about with respect to user-defined assets that I'd love to get your take on and why maybe they're not a good idea to have on your blockchain, I mean, this is something Bitcoiners say about Ethereum a lot, is that the security budget for the blockchain is the amount of money um, that miners are spending mining the blockchain, buying the hardware and things like that, or stakers are actually staking to secure the blockchain. And that amount will almost always be denominated or thought of in the amount that you can earn as a return for mining, which is in the form of Bitcoins or in the form of Ether if you're staking once they move to proof of stake or in the form of Tezos on Tezos. And so there's this symmetry. If it's Bitcoin and miners receive X amount of Bitcoin in return for securing the blockchain, and there's this asymmetry if the things supply, uh, the things um, traveling on the protocol are Ethereum plus all of these other tokens, um, but the only thing the miners are getting in reward is Ethereum. And so maybe the security budget becomes insufficient if the value of all the ETH in circulation is X and the value of all the assets on Ethereum is actually X times or X to the four, you know, because like maybe there's billions of dollars of stable coins on top of Ethereum. Do you think that the security budget criticism of user-defined assets is is accurate or? So I'm uh, I'm a cryptographer, not an economist. So uh, it's sometimes hard to me to to evaluate these things. But one, this seems to have not been a problem on Ethereum so far. That's true. Two, economic theories are all nice and good, but in reality, you know, they don't survive contact with the enemy, so they need to be tested. Yeah. Um, and so. If this is a concern, I think you'd find out in a non canvas way. Um, and I actually I don't think it would be a concern for Ethereum because, right, like you can just start charging fees in, in other assets, right, or fees that are proportional to the value of the transaction. And then I don't see the difference, right, because the miners have some amount of, of hardware. Right? This is really proof of work systems are actually proof of stake, right, but the stake is hardware. Yeah. Right? But that hardware wasn't paid for in Bitcoin or Ethereum or Zcash. It was paid for in, in Yuan or USD. Chances are right? in Yuan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so there's still a disconnect there, and yet the economics work out. So I suspect they would uh, in for uh, custom assets, for user-defined assets. In Zcash, there was a more interesting question, which is, period, the value of your transactions are completely disconnected from the amount of fees you pay. Because, again, to get privacy, we have to hide the fees. Ah. And I don't expect this to be a problem, but if it was a problem, I don't think we'd be saved by the fact that we don't have user-defined assets. I think we'd have that anyway. Interesting. Um, And then putting back on my actual cryptographer hat, well, there are a bunch of cool tricks you can use to work around that. Um, Particularly for custom assets, you could imagine that if some entity was issuing assets, like say you're doing a USDT on Zcash or USDC on Zcash, that you could require that for that entity to do that, they have to hold a proportional amount of Zcash. Hmm. And then they've got skin in the game. And so... How would you require that? You would require that protocol level? You, there are a couple of ways to do it. You could just have them agree to it, right? Like yeah. USDC is not enforced by a protocol in a certain sense. You're just hold, trusting that Circle holds the right assets. And so if they promise to hold this much Zach, 
That one you can actually audit easily. Uh, it's not and, very cypherpunk, though. I promise. No, it's not. I mean, the cypherpunk way to do it would be to do these uh, decentralized, like uh, DeFi things, like Uniswap and whatever. Uh, and you could also do that um, either by adding smart contracts to Zcash, which is complicated. You could add private smart contracts to Zcash, which is very complicated. I so, I was, so I was going to say so. So. There's, there seem to be two types of user-defined assets that we can imagine here too. There's the sort of like basic functionality where someone could use the Zcash blockchain to define new assets and move them around in these zero-knowledge proof-based transactions that are private. And then there's actually how Ethereum does user-defined assets, which isn't that there's like a, an ability to just create new assets. There's also an ability to build these smart contracts, which I already said I don't like the term, but it's the term that gets used, which are these sort of automated programs on the blockchain that might issue assets conditional to some external input. Like you were saying, like you could, you could actually do it the cypherpunk way and say the only way you can ever create asset Y is by provably locking up on the blockchain, denying your access to asset X. Right. Um, but for that, you're saying if we were to do it with Zcash on the Zcash blockchain, you wouldn't just need user-defined assets as a functionality of the Zcash blockchain. You would need smart contracts, which, as I understand, there's folks working on that, like private yeah. smart contracts, right? I am one of them. But actually, you, you, there's a third way. Actually, there, there, there are two other ways. One of them is you let the smart contract functionality live on Ethereum or Tezos or any of these other platforms that have uh, uh, contracts on them. And then you just do a cross-chain swap, basically to, you take Zcash or what I've been calling an envelope. Like you take your asset from uh, Ethereum, say it's a BAT, Brave Token, and you put it in this security envelope that nobody can see what it is or whatever, and you ship it around on the Zcash chain until you oh. start with it, you ship it back. And, and you, so, could do, you could do that with some sort of like automated cross-chain swap so that it could be that there's just a trustless or decentralized contract on the Ethereum blockchain that's issuing something and then it immediately gets swapped into a, a Zcash yeah. environment and trades around privately. You might even be able to do better than that. So there, are, I haven't followed this stuff um, that much, but one of the fascinating things is watching the first use of you know generic zero knowledge proofs for production was my paper, my PhD thesis, and now it's turned into the same bunch of stuff, including rollups on Ethereum. ZK rollups specifically. And these, let, in the end, in the goals of scalability, produce a zero knowledge proof that a bunch of stuff happened on the Ethereum blockchain. And so the interesting question, and I am now talking beyond what I've worked out the details for, yeah. is could you have Zcash also check one of those rollups? Because that's a short, small thing we could do. And then you basically directly be issuing assets on the Zcash chain without having to have built your own separate smart contract network. And I think this is possible. Interesting. So, so we have these different varieties of user-defined assets. I think even the simplest one, even if we, because maybe we want to go simpler because Ethereum's mm -hmm. out there trying all this stuff with very complicated contracts and things like that. And again, there should be division of labor for crypto. I think one of the in interesting, really simple user-defined assets is a stable coin, right? Mm -hmm. Is this um, and just a dollar back stable coin. Yep. Um, I used to think these were really boring um, because it's like, okay, you're just, we used to talk about colored coins in the Bitcoin space. It's like, okay, you're just taking a Satoshi or a couple of Satoshis and you're saying these Satoshis represent liabilities that I have on my, you know, legally incorporated bank-like business. And so this mm -hmm. is stuff like Tether was the, the first, um, USDC, things like that. Just asset-backed stable coins. The problem I have with most asset-backed stable coins is that they all travel on Ethereum or the Omni network, which is something to do with Bitcoin and Tether. I don't really know how Omni works, but they're all transparent networks. So all of these little transactions you're making in dollars, which is that sort of, oh, well, now we can have like a payment rail, um, not just a store of value. We don't have to worry about price fluctuations. We're just moving dollars around. But all these payments are happening in a much more public environment than the legacy banking system even is, which to me is kind of shocking. And sounds like we've gone, we've regressed, we've gone backwards. It's, so, it's actually a problem for the legacy banking system. So uh, I can attribute this to, quote, a large bank, close quote. Sure. Um, but there's, there's they, tons of them. There's yeah, like three. They were, they were looking at, um, 
building a uh, cryptocurrency or taking cryptocurrency or both. And it scared their compliance people because uh, when you take cash in another asset, you need to know who your customer is. That's mm -hmm. totally fine. That's an easy enough thing to do in, in any case. But because the information exists in the blockchain, everything's transparent, they were worried that they would have obligations to look further back and know yep. the customer's customer, the customer's customer customer. And this causes a whole bunch of problems. If it's a legal headache, it's a regulatory risk. And very clearly, then your money is just not fungible. Yeah. Right. So now you have to explain to your clients that, well, these, uh, whatever coin they were, are actually not worth as much as these other instances of that coin because, um, well, 10 transactions ago, they went through these people who we, they weren't illegal, but we don't trust them. Yeah. I mean, woe to the compliance person at a big bank when somebody higher up the food chain says, oh, by the way, we're going to get into this crypto stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because so that's like a downside risk for that that's that sad embattled compliance person on the OFAC side. Like, what if three hops down the chain? Those people aren't our customers. We didn't issue them this coin. We didn't redeem it from them. But we can see it on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. There's somebody on the sanctions list. Is that yeah. a problem for us? Do we just block this transaction, even though we had nothing to do with that transaction three times down the chain? Because they deal with cash deposits that probably went through all kinds of nefarious hands before they reach yeah. their customer who is not herself or himself nefarious. On the other side of the compliance nightmare is Graham Leach Bliley. And I think this is kind of like, this is almost too cute from a law mm -hmm. standpoint, but Graham Leach Bliley says that banks aren't allowed to reveal um, private personal information about financial transactions to other corporations, um, unless they go through some like disclosure with the customer and things like that. But if you're actively like issuing stable coins, which will then travel on a public network, you are encouraging your customers to freely just make public all their financial data, yep. um, including the transaction from their bank that issued them the stable coin to you know a stranger. So maybe like, it's funny how like, we have this term in the law called, uh, you're still culpable if you were willfully blind um, to, to an uh, illegal act, um, but, it solves a lot if we're willfully blind because it, it not because we're trying to um, willfully be blind to a bunch of illegality, but because we're trying to say, no, we're building tech that just recreates cash because everyone yeah. liked the cash system. Um, I mean, not everyone liked it, but I think there's a lot of good inherent in it. And it's worth having a serious conversation globally about whether there should be digital cash. And when we could talk about maybe, maybe they should have digital cash, but payments over a certain amount should be scrutinized in some way. But I think it's a valuable thing to build. So I, I sure. love this idea of using the Zcash blockchain for user defined assets, specifically just for dollar backed stable coins, because it really is the closest we'll get to truly recreating cash that's private and bearer and stable in value. Well, it's also the, the so, you know, if, if Zcash is the HTTPS for money, the real problem is I would argue there is an HTTP for money in the sense that, that that term would apply, right? Bitcoin exists and has been quite successful, but it's not doing those kind of like day-to-day -day transactions, it's not doing the same way that, you know, your day-to-day -day mm -hmm. life is done over the internet, right? And so Zcash is, in my opinion, largest problem uh, for adoption that's not due to, you know, we don't have good wallets or whatever else, is just that, the moment isn't there yet for that kind of use. But for user defined assets for stable coins, we are starting to see that become the HTTP for money, but right. in like a hardly insecure way. And also, I suspect we will see demand from the DeFi side of things because if you're trading large positions of various tokens and assets, you really don't want to broadcast those to the entire world. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, an actual Wall Street, like, Hedge fund firms are some of the people who first got into commercial spy satellites because they wanted to be able to verify what factories are actually being on the ground, right? The amount of like blockchain intelligence you can do uh, on, on Ethereum in particular uh, is just insane. Yeah. I like that metaphor. That's interesting to think that um, Bitcoin isn't the HTT per for money, stable coins might be um, yeah. because it's like more small value transactions, kind of like how we use the internet. It's like more small value interactions, mm -hmm. like all the little likes on Facebook, all the uh, emails we send on SMTP, which I guess is not HTTP, but you know, you get my, you get yeah. my point. 
So what is Bitcoin then? Bitcoin is like the, some precursor to some very valuable and important precursor to the internet where there were like only five, I guess the ARPANET, where there were only five parties on the internet and they were just doing like heavy intensive use for networking, like for academic it, research and things like that. It's an interesting question. I mean, right now it's, it's sort of pushing itself as, as a store of value, which I'd say is yeah. part of the HTTP for money, but not all of it. But I think the most charitable one is just that it's times not there for that either. Right, like maybe it is the thing that should be what most people use for transactions, but that time has not come. Yeah, albeit for me to say why, um, and therefore the moment for privacy on top of that also can't come. Right, and Bitcoin found a new niche uh, that it will sustain it until that moment comes. Zcash needs one of those, and so that's sort of how I've come to think about it. Right. Yeah, I like that framing. Uh, I, I think we could have a whole nother hour long conversation about user adoption because I think that's what you're hitting on is like the real issue um, and why Bitcoin's time hasn't fully come yet, maybe because it was supposed to be cash for the Internet, but no one's using it as yeah. cash for the Internet. They're just using it as good digital gold. But, but yeah. describe it as follows. He said it, Zcash is like trying to sell people seatbelts for automobiles in 1910. Right? <laughs> You're only going five miles per hour. You think about it, right? You could tell that as the technology progresses and cars get faster and more ubiquitous and everything else, yeah, you're yeah. going to need safety. Totally gonna need safety. It's like, like, you know, Jesus Christ, this is awful. But we're not there yet. And it's kind of hard. <laughs> To be that guy who's got like the new steam powered car yeah. and is like, dude, you got to strap in and you're going like yeah. two miles per hour down the street. Yeah. <laughs> like that is sort of where we are sitting, right? We, we can tell that something along the lines of this stuff is going to be the future, right? We don't quite know what, we don't know whether it's going to be steam or electric or gas or diesel or then, you know, do the whole cycle of those again, but it's going to be the future. And so we need to start figuring out how to make it safe when that future comes. Oh, that's great. That's probably a good place to, to wrap it up because that's another good justification for the Zcash Foundation. Now I'm starting to make this sound like I'm just plugging the Zcash Foundation, but for nonprofits in general, like I hope there are more of them. There should be a nonprofit focused on Bitcoin development. There should be more nonprofits out there working on this stuff. Coin Center itself is a nonprofit focused on the legal risks to the technology. But like looking far ahead, like being that crazy innovator who was already thinking about seatbelts back in the early days of the automobile is not something that the market's going to deliver. And I think, you know, well-run nonprofits with a clear vision for the future could actually help build that stuff. So it's yeah. good. Cool. Well, thank you for being my guest, Ian. This has been a, a wide-ranging and fun conversation. Cool. No problem. <laughs> All right. Take care.